Coming up on Tech News Today, we'll talk about Cyber Monday, just how cybery it is and whether you get some uh, discounts. There's a lot of money rolling in. Also, Google gets punked on a PR service and Minecraft Redstone update coming. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, November 26, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects, templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media downloads, go to pond5.com slash TNT. And by the new Squarespace. Squarespace introduces a new content management system, making it faster and easier to create a high-quality website or blog or online portfolio, plus more than 50 new features, including mobile responsive designs. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT11. And by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world and start each day with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feed. Uh, according to a press release on PR Web this morning, Google had bought Wi-Fi provider Icoa for $400 million. The only trouble is that's not true, according to Icoa. The company's chief financial officer, Erwin Valshing Jr., told CNET in an email that the news is false. He did not provide any other information. Two million units of the Galaxy Note 2 have shipped since November 2nd, and Samsung says it might reach 20 million in sales. Meanwhile, the company's still wrapped up in proving that a lot of its other products don't infringe on Apple patents, like the six Samsung uh, products that were filed in the San Jose Federal Court in California last week. We've got the Galaxy S3, the Galaxy Tab 8.9 Wi-Fi tablet, the Galaxy Tab 2 10.1, the Galaxy Rugby Pro, and the Galaxy S3 Mini. Seems like people can't help themselves when it comes to online bargains. Comscore says that U.S. retail e-commerce spending for Black Friday was over $1 billion, which is up 26% compared to last year. Amazon was the top online retailer with the most visits. If you're curious about what people were actually buying, the top moving product was something called apparel and accessories, followed by computer hardware, which I understand. Oh, I think you you have to use apparel uh, if other people are around while you're using computers. Probably. That's what I've heard. Uh, Samsung's investigation of 105 of its suppliers has turned up several inadequate practices, but the company found no evidence of underage workers. Samsung did find overtime excesses and inordinate fines for being late or absent from work. China Labor Watch had alleged it had found evidence of long working hours and underage workers. Samsung says it is reviewing a further 144 suppliers in China. Did you guys go to MineCon this year? I wish I had. It was in Paris. Yeah, it was actually <laughs> Disneyland Paris. Sounds like a lot of fun. Pretty big deal. It's actually about 4,500 of the game's biggest fans. They come to meet each other, dress up, uh, f meet people that have founded the game, talk to the Minecraft creators. There were also some interesting sessions about how to use Minecraft in serious settings, too, at the con. Uh, used in schools as a way to teach all kinds of subjects like programming, geology, and even geology. Politics. Let's talk about the latest, hottest phones. Nokia has unveiled its new Asha line of phones. The devices are aimed at the low end of the market. They both sell for $62. The Asha 205 is that BlackBerry-style phone with a QWERTY keyboard, and the 206 is a candy bar-style phone, which looks like something from the mid-'90s. The phones come with Slam, which is Nokia's name for sharing content via Bluetooth to other devices, not just the Asha line. The phones are expected to launch by the end of the year. TechCrunch reports that China Times has information that Google will launch its own brand of touchscreen Chrome OS notebooks. According to the report, Taiwan-based Compal will receive the internal parts this month to begin assembly. That could mean a product could ship by the end of the year. Two posters are making the rounds at Facebook headquarters that highlight the company's commitment to Android. At least that's what it seems like. One has a Google Android logo robot hovering behind a plate of dog food. <laughs> Printed behind the robot is the phrase... Do you droid food? 
Get it? Mm. See what they did there? Yeah. With Facebook asking its employees to switch today at the poster's bottom. In the second poster, Facebook shows a graph of device shipments for iPhones versus Androids. You could probably guess which one looks more exponential on the growth side. Facebook describes on the poster, here come the Androids. Ah, uh, but goodbye, Justin Bieber. Uh, he's, he's not leaving. He's no longer with us? No, he's still with us. Uh, oh. But his video is no longer the top YouTube video. It has been horse danced off by size Gangnam Style. The Korean music star's video passed Bieber's baby on Saturday. It took Gangnam Style only five months to rack up more than 805 million views. And WordStream projects that Gangnam Style, if it keeps this pace, might reach 1 billion views by December 11th. Which also means by December 12th, it'll be completely forgotten. That's good. An 11-day meeting of the UN's International Telecommunications Union is set to take place starting December 3rd. The ITU will discuss over 1,300 proposals that may may or may not lead to more control over the internet. A European-backed proposal wants to charge companies an extra fee for reaching users across borders. So there's some crazy things out there. The ITU says it does not want to govern the internet, but it needs to update its 1989 communications treaty, which was written before the internet was public. Let's uh, thank our first sponsor for today's show. This episode brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. Uh, I know a lot of folks in our audience are media makers of their own. You've got blogs, you've got films, there's, there's people who program apps. And if you're making any of that kind of stuff, Running into stock media it can be a problem, if you, especially if you don't want to get caught doing something illegal. Just grabbing an image off of a, a web search is not the way to go. Uh, if you want to be sure that you have the rights to use the images and you want good images on top of that, forget just getting the rights, but finding like amazing helicopter shots and things that would cost you way more to make or, or obtain than you would be able to get otherwise. Pond5 is the place to go. Uh, photos, vector illustrations, music tracks, sound effects, customizable motion graphics, templates, 3D models, and more. It's growing by leaps and bounds every day because if you're a media maker, you can also sell those items yourself. You can upload and get top industry rates. Uh, so go check it out. If you're a developer, a designer, a filmmaker, a video maker, Pond5 has something that can help you out. They're shaking up the traditional stock agency business. And this month, you can get 50 free stock media downloads at pond5.com slash TNT. That's P-O-N-D, the number five, dot com slash TNT. Get, get it now. 50, you can, you can make an entire film out of 50 free stock media downloads. So go check it out. And we thank Pond5 for their support of Tech News Today. Also thanking Lindsay Turrentine, Editor-in-Chief of CNET Reviews, for joining us today. How's it going, Lindsay? It's going very well. Are you having a good Cyber Monday? I am. This is, like, this is the best time of year for us. We got lots of we got lots to talk about as far as online sales and that sort of thing. But let's start off with Facebook shaking up the ad market. Ah, did you guys all get your emails from Facebook over the weekend that said proposed changes to our governance and privacy policy? Yes. And yeah. did you freak of out and say course, Facebook's going to read gonna... every word of it? Well, it's actually not as long as some of the other <laughs> changes true. to their policies, but this is the sort of thing Facebook does every so often, and people go, "Oh no, privacy is truly dead." There's some there's some interesting uh, points, um, which which gives you a sense of where Facebook is going uh, with with the new privacy policy. Facebook has pretty much said definitively, we will now use data about the stuff that you like on Facebook to show you ads outside of Facebook. This has been something that's been a long time coming. Uh, the idea that Facebook is actually going uh, to be running its own ad network, not a not a middleman with a with an ad network that already exists to build its own ad network outside the Facebook walled garden, which would, you know, be a lot like Google's AdSense, for sure. example, which is obviously a huge moneymaker uh, for Google. Facebook hasn't really had uh, a lot of great success with click-through rates on what would be considered traditional ads on Facebook, um, particularly with the mobile sector. They've got to they've got to think outside the box. Um, and uh, Chris Dixon, who's uh, actually the newest partner at, at Andreessen Horowitz, as of gosh last week, I think, said, you know, you have so much traffic creating um, uh, it, in Facebook. You know, if you if you create something that is like an AdSense, even a little bit like the success that Google's had with AdSense, you could increase your revenue two times over for something like, what are they bringing in about $5 billion in annual uh, ad revenue now? Uh, mark that up to $10 billion and, and and Facebook's looking really good, at least with their investors. Also another interesting thing in their uh, their proposed policy changes. Facebook wants to end 
the voting process. This is the one that got everybody upset. Right? Yeah. Uh, when it changes governance policies. Now, this is something that Facebook introduced back a while ago because <laughs> it was trying to get people to kind of come down off the ledge every time they made some sort of a policy change. They go, we, the users, are so upset. Let's have all these protest groups. Facebook said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get 30% of users to basically vote and go ahead and support something before we make a significant change. So this isn't going to apply, this, this never applied to just any little, you know, design change here and there, but something that really, really affects uh, the Facebook community at large, something significant. Facebook says, well, the last vote we had, we saw 0.03% of users participating. So not 3%, not 0.3%, 0.03% of users participating. If you were to get up to 30% of Facebook users, if you sort of think about that, that'd be about 300 million users, which is, I think, uh, in, in one of the comparison stories I read, it's like twice as many people that voted in the last presidential election in the U.S. So really hard to do. So Facebook is saying, you know, it was, it was a good idea, right? But you guys just aren't using it, so we don't want to. We don't want this to actually be the way that, that policies are being pushed forward. I'm just laughing, thinking if, if, if countries work that way. Oh, people aren't using it. Let's cut it off. I mean, yeah, nobody's voting. <laughs> eh, eh, we don't we'll just appoint the president from <laughs> no, now on. But, but for Facebook to do that kind of change doesn't seem like it's that big a disaster. Like you were saying, the, the percentage of people that were voting about these things were pretty minuscule. And for Facebook to get that many people interested in a change in their policies, I mean, when you get the email, I think I can't even find it in my email. It's like it's probably in the spam folder at this point because I don't ever click these things or ever read Facebook policy changes because I'm either going to use a service or they're going to do something that I find out on this show that, they, that outrages me. And then I'm like, well, I'm going to still use it anyway because to not have a Facebook page is almost just bizarre. Like you kind of have to have one or you're like, oh, you're not on Facebook? Oh, you don't exist. So you still have to do it because you're part of the billion people on it. I think they should just have a town hall kind of setting, right? Like this happens in local government. People really don't like a store going in. You can come on one evening and you can say, you can give your opinion. And for that 0.03% of Facebook users who care a lot, they should be able to voice their concerns, but just sort of one-time deal, get it out there, see if people care. Yeah, I, I, I think they're right. I think Facebook's doing the right thing. They're saying, look, you guys aren't using this, so we're going to try to come up with something else. It's not that they don't want to listen to the opinions of people anymore. Well, it's just, it was, it, was a, it was a really good idea. Hey, listen, users, if you're so upset about the changes that we're making, we want to make sure that the majority of you are, are excited about the changes and you have a voice. Well, no one's using their voice, so you got to come up with something else. Yeah. But is this a license for Facebook to do something crazy now? They're like, oh, you're not voting now. Let's do something way off base, like do an, an ad platform outside of this. That's not very off base. Didn't you see this coming for a while? Well, sure, but now we don't have 30% who can't, I mean, you can't vote now, right? Like, I don't think there's any connection between the two. Are you trying to draw a connection between no, just trying to find something, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't think so. We're going to do something nuts, <laughs> and you can't vote on it, like an ad network, which will make us more money. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's talk about those 4,500 people who go into Disneyland Paris uh, for Minecon uh, this weekend. Uh, there are 8 million PC versions of Minecraft out there, not counting console versions like Xbox, not counting the mobile app versions. Uh, and there were all kinds of stars on stage, not only just Notch, of course, the founder of Minecraft, but also player celebrities as well. The big news is the Redstone update coming in January. Uh, update 1.5 gives you variable signal strength called analog, a capacitor block that works like a repeater. Uh, the block will have one input and one output, and the output is determined by the input. So weighted pressure plates, for instance. Uh, there's also a daylight detector for solar power fireworks. They're going to fix the southeast bug. A lot of you out there are kind of like me going, I don't know what any of this means. Uh, but the Minecraft players are very excited by this stuff. <laughs> and Lindsay, I know you've got a couple of uh, Minecraft enthusiasts in your house, right? I do. One of them is nine, and he's kind of the, the broker of all things Minecraft in our house. And I don't feel like I know much more about this than you do, but um, all of those words sound vaguely familiar. <laughs> I do know that bugs and running into glitches on Minecraft is a really exciting event for a large part of the community. I heard my son talking with his friend yesterday about, oh my God, what's the worst glitch you've encountered on Minecraft? And they had a really wonderful conversation about it. It's like Easter eggs for them. Yeah, well, but this is their whole world. I mean, they talk about it constantly. In my limited uh, knowledge of the Southeast bug, I know it's the, not the kind of bug that, that crashes your game, but it's something you can actually exploit and take advantage of. And so some people are upset 
that it's going to get uh, that it's going to get squashed. Lots of other news coming out of this. Uh, folks running Raspberry Pi will now get a version of Minecraft, the Pi edition. It's a port of the mobile app that you'll be able to use for free. It's coming from the, the Raspberry Pi makers. Uh, also, a partnership between UN Habitat and Mojang called Block by Block will model development plans around the world. For instance, an Ndugu playground, part of the Kibera slum region and the outskirts of Nairobi, is being modeled first as part of this project. And you'll be able to walk around and, and use Minecraft to reconstruct the neighborhood and, and give input to how you think these sorts of developments uh, should happen. Also, just today, uh, Minecraft uh, announced that there Mojang announced Minecraft Reality for iOS was is coming out for a buck ninety nine. Lets you take your Minecraft creations and put them in augmented reality situations, so you can see what they would look like in real life. If you have a Minecraft car, for instance, you can put it in a parking space and, and see it sitting next to all the other cars on the street. So, I mean, given the enthusiasm and what you're talking about, Lindsay, with all the kids just you really, I mean, going crazy over bugs. Uh, means that this is a really over-the-top uh, phenomenon. It reminds me of World of Warcraft several it's, years back, of what World of Warcraft used to be. It's really, it's actually really amazing. I sort of, I mean, as a parent of a kid who's, and two kids, but really one, who's really enthusiastic about this, it's fun to watch the massive creativity, right? I mean, there are little boys who are building all kinds of anything that can explode in Minecraft, but then I watch... I'm going to make some stereotyping statements here. But my daughter, when she plays, she's kind of gently building these soft and delicate universes. And, and this is accessible to almost every kid. And it's just really fun to watch them get creative. It's kind of like the digital Lego at yeah. this point. It's the Lego toy that everybody builds with right now. Well, and it's funny. My son actually just said to me the other day, Mom... There's like one little weird Lego Minecraft kit. Why aren't there more? There should be millions of. Yeah, Lego. no kidding. That's like they're a, clamoring for this. That's and, a cross you know, licensing I, deal from heaven right there. It, for sure. it really is. If they, I think they're sort of testing it out right yeah. now based on what I've seen. There was one little limited edition run of a Minecraft set. But also, you know, it's interesting that this has exploded so quickly. We were talking about this before the show a little bit. That even Halloween costume manufacturers didn't see it coming. So it was sort of a wonderful year for little kids. And, you know, we had about five or six different Minecraft outfits at, in fourth grade at my son's school. And they were all homemade, every yeah. single one, you know, boxes painted in a grid or pieces of paper printed out from the Internet and pasted onto something. It was really kind of wonderful to see. And I think next year it'll be, you yeah. know. Industry will have caught up, and and we yeah. will have moved on to plastic versions. Yeah, the the plastic box game uh, unlicensed <laughs> uh, costume will be out next time for sure. All yeah. right, let's talk a little bit about uh, that PR web punking that apparently has happened. Shall we? The headlines read; they were screaming. I saw this early on. Google announced it's buying Alcoa. <laughs> Yeah, they were. This is, this is, I have a very strange newsreader at home. Uh, it was announced it was buying ICO for $400 million. Now, I saw the story. It was just kind of hanging around. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Uh, ICOA provides wi uh, wireless broadband internet, high traffic areas like airports, restaurants, and campgrounds. This sounds brilliant. It sounds great. I read the press release, and this seems to have a typo in it. I'm like, ah, it's not a big deal. Maybe somebody was just excited. It's $400 million. And then it comes out like 30 minutes later. I see a note from Tom saying, oh, the story is not true. So I, I take a click into it. It's not true. ICOA's CFO says that, tells CNET, news is false. There's no deal. Hasn't explained any other thing. Google hasn't commented yet as of uh, this recording. I, I guess my biggest thing was, is anyone else just disappointed this story isn't true? Like, I kind of <laughs> wanted Google to buy this company so already. So is it, is, it, is it an outright hoax, or are the company saying, no one signed anything yet? You know what I mean? All it's been is, like, this This news is false. That's all we've got so far. Wow. It, it sounds pretty wrong. I mean, I know that the reason that Shara, who wrote this story on CNET News, didn't write the first version was because she, she just saw a lot of red flags, and she sent out an email to everybody saying, there's something weird here. Hold on. And she was noticing things like all the typos and the fact that this wasn't on Google's own site, um, which, you know, could be just the result of bad timing or a mistake, but it seemed off. When you get a several of those red flags at once, you start to wonder. Yeah. I, I'll be curious what the story is of how this made its way onto PR web, whether it was human error 
uh, somebody just getting getting punked, or or if like I as is saying, there maybe there were some talks and speculation, and and something got leaked and accidentally posted. Yeah, I mean we've we've seen we've seen I think some of Google's I think SEC filings come out early by accident. Sure. And so I mean I guess it's not so crazy to see something like this happen if this was real, but. I'm just, I'm, I just really, again, like wanted this to be true because Google's got Chromebooks, they have these devices, and if you had an infrastructure that existed already, at least you could have a a wider use for your Chromebook beyond the included 3G that's with some of those. Just It just seemed like it fit, and they already had Google Fiber. It's just like, ah, this makes sense, and it's not true. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I didn't know that campgrounds had so much wireless broadband internet. <laughs> I think I'm camping in the wrong places. You must be. Well, you saw the Nexus 7 ads, right? The guy's out camping. He's got he's Wi-Fi. In his backyard. But he could be camping with this was true. I, okay. That's not true. All right. I, uh, I, it's a when I, when I first saw the story come across, I saw Larry Dignan's write-up of it on ZDNet. It was the first place I saw it. And my thought was, oh, it's like Cisco. It's, it's a trend now because Cisco bought Meraki last week. So immediately it had a, in my mind, it had a connection of like, oh, Okay, I guess I guess Google's making another step towards ISP, and and can, yeah, that's an interesting take, competing with Cisco. But uh, Lindsay, as you mentioned, lots of different red flags in there. Uh, make make you think that this is probably just some somebody got got hacked or punked or fished or or, or something over at PR Web. I thought that it made sense with uh, the rumor about Dish and Google working together. And Dish wanted a company that mm -hmm. had infrastructure. I'm like Wi-Fi could be this bridge between cellular and, and yeah. things, but nope, a bridge too far. Turns out. Bridge to nowhere. Bridge to nowhere. <laughs> uh, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Uh, introducing a new content management system, Squarespace 6. Still focused on ease of use. Beautiful design, giving you the best customer support. The new Squarespace is an entirely new product. If you sign up now, or, or if you, even if you're an older user, you can convert to Squarespace 6. You get the latest web technologies, HTML5, CSS3, JavaScript, JSON, for speed and flexibility, and the best mobile experience. That's the big thing we talk about all the time with Squarespace 6. It's nice when you look at your site, and I've done this with my, my book's website. Uh, you look at it on, on a laptop, and it looks great. You use one of those templates that they provide, do a little customizing, and it looks excellent. But then when you look at it on your phone, it doesn't look like a squished down version or, or a really tiny miniaturized version. They actually redo. They have templates that say, oh, you're on a phone. We're going we're gonna to redo the layout. We're going to resize the images. Uh, and all that happens seamlessly, so your site it looks good no matter what screen it's on. Uh, beautiful templates with 100% drag and drop functionality for all your customization tools. And of course, the amazing Squarespace service 24-7. Uh, uh, they are ready to make sure that you have a site that is working. Uh, we told many of the stories about during the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, they, they were carrying buckets of fuel up to keep their data center up so that Squarespace sites did not go down. Uh, but you don't have to take any of our words for it. Go do a free trial, squarespace.com. Sign up for a free account. You don't have to give them a credit card or anything. Just sign up. Uh, no codes or nothing. But if you do decide to purchase it, remember this offer code, uh, TNT11, and get 10% off your first purchase on new Squarespace accounts. Don't forget about free domain registration if you buy the annual plan subscription. That's squarespace.com. Use the offer code TNT11. We thank them for their support of Tech News today. All right. I know that uh, CNET folks have been uh, chomping at the bit for holiday season, as you, as you always are, <laughs> uh, Lindsay. Uh, Black Friday brought in a boatload of money, Sarah. Yeah, it did. Unhappy Cyber Monday, everybody. Uh, Comscore has some numbers out, as they do. Black Friday, uh, in the U.S., retail e-commerce spending was $1.042 billion, which is a lot, but it's also 26% higher than Black Friday last year. In fact, it's the first time that Black Friday sales surpassed one billion in online spending. And it's not, it wasn't just Friday. For the holiday season to date, 13.7 billion has been spent online, which is also up. It's up 16% from this time last year. And consumers spent 633 million on Thanksgiving Day itself, which is a 32% increase from last year. And of course, these are online sales. <laughs> There's not people breaking into stores that are closed on Thanksgiving Day. This is buying online, but just goes to show you online spending is just up. Now you wonder, okay, well, where's everybody spending their money? Amazon was the most popular e-commerce site by visits, not a huge surprise, followed by Walmart, then Best Buy, Target, finally Apple. It's rounding up the top five. 57.3 million Americans visited online retail sites on Black Friday, which again is up 18% from last year. 
And what's also interesting is the most amount of dollars spent online in one particular category went to apparel and accessories, which is more than about 25% of all the dollars that were spent online for Black Friday, which you go, okay, well, what else would it have been? The category that it's historically been number one is computer hardware. It was even as recently as last year. So people are buying shoes and clothes and things like that for their loved ones more than computer hardware, at least for the first time. Bad news for tech news today. Maybe it should become <laughs> shoe news today. <laughs> well, we I just think, need to wear more snazzy clothing. We could cover Zappos is, and things like that. I mean, it's still tech. It's still clothes. Sure. Facebook yeah. gifts, everybody. That's apparel and accessories. Get a little <laughs> candle. Uh, Cyber Monday, of course, is today. Comsquare says if if the trends continue like they have for the past few years, it'll be the heaviest online shopping day of the season. Sales could reach $1.5 billion, possibly even more. A uh, report uh, from IBM says, as far as people buying things on tablets for Black Friday, guess which tablet dominated? Anyone? Uh, Anyone? The Asus E-Pad? Anyone? Close. <laughs> Nexus, really close. The iPad. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, it was iPad. E-Pad. E-Pad, iPad. I actually don't know if the E-Pad was it's even registered. E-Pod. Uh, mobile shopping Spanish. sales up uh, 6% uh, this year. Mobile visits to e-commerce sites uh, 20, uh, made up 24% of online shoppers, which is a 10% rise from last year. So, I mean, the trends say it. People are shopping online. People are using tablets more than they were a year ago. That clearly makes sense because there's just more tablet users. But uh, yeah, I mean, brick and mortar sales, they make a big deal about all of that. I was actually sort of by accident. Last Friday, I was in Miami and I had to get a iPad cable. So I went into the South Beach Apple store and the place was a zoo. I mean, people were like, it was almost like a joke. Like they were just tripping over each other and, and there were a bunch of uh, employees and people and it was nuts. And I had sort of forgotten that it was Black Friday. I'm like, gosh, is Miami just like this? All the time? This is a crazy <laughs> Apple store. And then I realized, oh my gosh, why am I shopping on Black Friday? You're right. And uh, so it was it was clearly nuts. It's not as if people aren't going out to the stores because they they, they certainly were, at least where I was on, on, on that Friday. I think the report said that the brick and mortar sales were down 1.8% or something. So it's not mm -hmm. a huge decline, but... I mean, I'm actually somewhat surprised that the iPad was used so much for shopping since there is, I think on the Amazon app, can you buy stuff directly through it? Sure. Because it yeah. doesn't have that 30% cut. That means Apple's getting a nice... Not not for retail stuff. Okay. Only for digital stuff. All right, I'm just really curious about that. I was like, okay, well, I, I, I always thought the iPad was a really good experience when it comes to shopping, when it comes to these apps. They've really done a great job. Amazon has one. I think Zappos has a really good version of their their storefront because the websites don't really work so great in there because you have small targets and things. It's just really easy to buy things with one click. It's even easier when you just can do it with one tap. There's something different about that's, that. That's that's what has happened this year. That's why everybody is getting started so early. It's just easier to shop this year. I mean, we've, we've seen an uptick in review reading um, earlier than we've seen in the past. It's a greater spike. I think probably in the tech space because there's a lot more choice this year than there's been in the past. Despite, you know, iPad being the most successful mobile shopping platform, um, there are many, many options to explore right now. So everybody is getting started early and then they're just making quick decisions. It's really easy. And even when it comes to apparel and things like that, it's so easy now to buy a pair of shoes via Zappos and send it right back. People have gotten used to that and it's just, We've moved on from just tech. Yeah, and Cyber Monday has become a self-fulfilling prophecy. For a long time, it was not the highest online shopping day of the year, but they kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it until recently it now has become. it. I mean, I know you guys have a, a Cyber Monday guide up as part of the holiday gift guide at CNET. Is, is it a better day for deals than other days, or is it just because of the marketing everyone has decided to go online today? I think that it's a better day for certain deals, right? Like you can get uh, a Kindle Fire for $129 today. Uh, that offer was also on the table a couple weeks ago, though. So it sort of depends on specifically what you're shopping for. We try to outline that really well on the site, but um, it, it depends. I think that any time from Thanksgiving through maybe even the end of this week is a pretty good time to be online shopping. Yeah. All right, uh, let's move on to something you won't be able to shop for until next holiday season. But we got another Xbox rumor coming from The Verge. Yeah, new Xbox rumor. This is Tom Warren reporting uh, last week. Like, I think we just finished up things, and I saw the story come up. I'm super excited about it. Uh, the Verge reporting Microsoft is building an Xbox set-top box. It would be a low-cost alternative to the console. It doesn't replace the Xbox. It would be a second SKU to be unveiled before the holiday season 2013. It'd run the same core components of Windows 8, 
It would have uh, casual games on it, and you'd have all the Xbox Live content you're used to, so video, music, all that uh, Amazon apps, everything you could think of that was... And that the cable television integration, all that stuff, right? I believe so, yeah. yeah. So pretty much everything except the hardcore gaming in a box, and the move apparently is part of a broader effort by Microsoft to get its Xbox architecture on more devices. So not just the console, but a phone that could run all Xbox Live services and the set-top box... I guess the question is, does it make sense for Microsoft to have a two-device setup, especially when you know there are a lot of, the set-top box space is pretty full when it comes to Apple TV, Roku, and whatever streaming thing you're thinking about? Do they need to compete with itself? They I still- think it makes sense I, from a from a product standpoint. I mean, we've got Xbox ending up competing with the likes of Roku, but it makes sense because Xbox is working on a content strategy. So if Xbox is going to dive deep into serving content to you, it needs to be accessible not just to people who want to spend 350 bucks on a console, but people who were looking at spending $50 on an over-the-top box. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Lindsay. I, I think internally Microsoft looks at this as the logical next step from the, the base models of the Xbox 360 that we've seen, where they have minimal amount of storage, uh, they, they have you know lower capabilities than, than the more expensive Xbox 360, but they still play games. So you go down one more step from that and say, okay, this isn't going to play all of the big games that you would get on the Xbox 720 or whatever it ends up uh, being called. Uh, but if you're looking for something that plays some games, casual games, like you can play on your Microsoft Windows 8 uh, desktop or tablet, uh, then it's kind of filling, they're trying to fill every niche there and saying it's a it's a step up from a tablet, it's not a full computer, and it also fills what you're talking about, Lindsay, that set-top box uh, space that is still open for anybody to seize right now. So, so well, And the last I heard, this is really interesting, and this was a few months ago, but um, I know that more than 50% of Xbox use was actually non-gaming. Right. I mean, doesn't this make more sense for a company like Sony, which has like an online, I mean, they bought Gaikai, right? They have this cloud gaming service. If the Xbox, is it going to be confusing to have one Xbox that can do really good games and then there's the other Xbox that doesn't have that? Because it sounds like something else that Microsoft has done recently. What would that be? The Xbox RT? Is that what you're joking I about? Just, I mean, I, oh, I just, I don't. The Xbox RT. That's I just funny. don't, I don't, yeah, I don't see why this is that bad of an idea. I, I don't have an Xbox, right? And Lindsay, you make a great point that, I mean, people don't always use Xboxes for gaming. You don't have to be a gamer at all. You can get a lot out of it. But I think that they're still at, well, you know, I don't know. It's kind of a commitment. Do I really need this sort of thing? When you kind of turn it into Xbox has some great stuff, plus integrates with your home theater the way that you already have it, and it's a little bit less of a commitment, and there's maybe a little bit less focus on hardcore gaming. Well, there is going to be, but 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 less focus even on gaming as a whole. That could appeal to a lot of people. Microsoft's trying to make an ecosystem, and they, they're they they're going after the person who might be going to spend $99 on an Apple TV or a Roku to say, hey, spend $99 on this. You've got Windows 8. You can, you can have Xbox Music now. You can have Xbox TV. We'll integrate with your cable system, maybe. And you don't have to be one of those people who's like, well, I'd buy an Xbox 360, but I'm not a gamer. This is, this is targeting those people specifically, it sounds like. All right, let's finish up with the rise of the machines. The University of Cambridge uh, has a proposal to host the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, which would open next year. Uh, it's being proposed and founded by Bertrand Russell Professor of Philosophy Hugh Price, Cosmology and Astrophysics Professor Emeritus Martin Rees, and your friend and mine, Skype co-founder Jan Tallinn. Uh, they posted back in August, actually Jan and Martin Rees posted back in August, a, uh, a, a post about the risks of artificial intelligence. And they say, look, it, this, is, this is serious because we actually don't know whether artificial intelligence poses a risk right now. In fact, Hugh Price, the philosopher, warns that computer intelligence could eventually mimic human evolution through the years at an accelerated rate. And compare what we have done to other species on the planet, artificial intelligence could potentially do to us. He told the Associated Press, it tends to be regarded as a flaky concern, but given that we don't know how serious the risks are, that we don't know the time scale, dismissing the concerns is dangerous. What we're trying to do is push it forward in respectable scientific community. Uh, and, and he posits that the biggest risk AI could pose to us is not that they would be hostile. It's not a Terminator type thing where they would try to wipe out humanity. It's that they wouldn't care. It would just move past caring about humanity. And, and one example given was, if you're a gorilla, 
you know, humans aren't necessarily going out and, and shooting gorillas and trying to wipe gorillas off the planet, but your habitat's getting wiped out because of other things that humans are doing. So it's, it's easy to joke about this. It's easy to look at this and go, wait a minute, really? We're going to spend time and money on the concern? But they make a good point, which is it's going to be too late if AI does get its capability, and we just don't know how fast it's coming, we should study that. I mean, it's not necessarily apathy. If, if computers are more concerned about other computers or their, the other AI units, whatever you'd call those things, if that's what they're, they're worried about, and they're worried about their own ecosystem, eventually, if they become bigger, kind of like what humans do, it's like, oh yeah, we're just gonna keep taking over fields and encroach on other, uh, other organisms. Wouldn't that be the fear that people are concerned about? Not just this apathetic nature of the, of the AI, that the fact that if it wants to just take care of itself, it could push out other things out there. That's exactly right. It's it's not it's not that it's it's that they wouldn't they'd be apathetic about our welfare uh, eventually. Uh, and and again, you could say like, oh come on, people have been talking about AI for years. It's not a problem. It's not going to happen. It always ends up being you know overhyped and under delivering. Uh, but it is getting better all the time. And at some point, it could. It is conceivable that it could catch fire and take off and what these guys are saying is maybe we should just you know do do some serious thinking and, and be ready for it lindsay do you think this is uh, crazy i think it's fascinating yeah. but one thing i just want to say i love the name project for existential risk <laughs> i love that too <laughs> it's just existential risk it's great uh, no i think about this all the time i mean when you sit down at your laptop and google gives you better answers than answers than you thought you even wanted for a question. You start to just drift in that direction, train of thought. I do all the time. Maybe I'm a complete nerd. Noah, but you're, a, you're among friends, if, that, if that's the case. <laughs> Sarah, do you think this is a good use of smart people's time? Because these, these, are, these are some pretty darn smart people. <sighs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think I've, I've seen too many sci-fi movies about what happens when you give robots too much power. I say uh, keep them to the Roombas. Uh, don't give them any more access because they're just going to evolve and we will suffer. Yeah, great. Now you're going to save get, the gorillas. You're going to get robot rights protesters after you. Well, come at me. <laughs> I can deal with it. <laughs> Apathetic freaks. Uh, <laughs> save the gorillas. Down with the robots. You heard it here. We uh, next tomorrow will start doing tech shoes today uh, because that's <laughs> the future. But let's move on now to the randomizer. Randomizer. I don't know about you guys, uh, but the Wii system music is infectious. I, I know you guys don't have Wii U's yet. Uh, Lindsay, do you have a Wii U? Have you played around with it a bunch? I, I don't, actually. We are... Don't tell my kids we're moving in the Xbox direction. Well, now you can get the experience of installing a Wii U without having to go through the pain, agony, and cost of it by downloading the unofficial nine-track album of Wii U system music. So here's what you do. You find the firmware update music and just put it on a repeat for like an hour. And now you've got the experience of installing a Wii U in your in your It saves you 350 bucks. I yeah. mean, you don't even buy the thing. Save you a lot I of just, money. I, I, I just wonder about the titles of this. You know, Hot Tea and Firmware Updates is one of them. Let's all go to <laughs> Nintendo Land. That's fine. I like, I like this one. Remain calm and adjust your settings. I mean, there's just some interesting names for these. Are these the actual warnings that show up? I don't, I assume uh, no, no. These are there. these are the names made up by the people who who created this uh, this downloadable album. Oh, don't! Do that. that gives me the shakes when you do that. <laughs> please wait, Tom. No, I just want to play Super no, Mario. Please wait. No, it's so One more hour. This is nice. It stops being soothing at a certain point. There's probably a graph <laughs> chart for that. <laughs> No, I, I, we played the Wii U games. We played a bunch of Nintendo Land stuff. Played some Super Mario Brothers on Thanksgiving. Uh, it really does work well with multiple people. Or one person has the pad and can do things like hide and seek while the other people try to find them. And that I, the, it, it, it is a good gaming experience. But we did have that frustration of every time we switched games, it would say, oh, we got to do a system update for this game. And Ugh. we just did one yesterday for that same game. Right? Like every day you're going to push something and, they, and it's slow. Well, that's why all the music's so calming. Yeah. You don't want to get into that it has, rage. It has it's to just be. just really, really chill. It's like, all right. <laughs> all right, let's take a quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Audible. This episode brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000 downloadable titles, getting bigger all the time. Uh, all types of literature, fiction, nonfiction, periodicals. They've got Scientific American. They've got magazines. They've got New York Times in there. And listeners of Tech News Today get a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their service. I do this all the time when I'm driving. I, I drove a lot over the weekend. I know a lot of you guys were driving 
uh, because of the holidays. Uh, and audiobooks are essential if you're going to be driving long distances. Uh, Jason, you were telling me about an audiobook you've been enjoying uh, from Audible. Yeah, I've, I've been loving it. Um, and I mentioned it a little bit on the social hour last uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I Want My MTV. It's an, an uncensored kind of uh, biography about the first, I think, 13 years of MTV. And really, it just got, dives into the details of all the music videos that you grew up with and how they were made and what all the artists thought. I mean, it's just, it's a really impressive and very long book. I think it's uh, close to something like 18 hours or something. So you totally get your money's worth. That's on one it. of the things I like about audiobooks, yeah. too, is that you, you, I know how much time to set aside to finish it. Because I do a lot of reading on audiobooks for Sword and Laser, and I'm and, and something like, I have to have it done by a certain time, so I know how far I am into it time-wise. Uh, you can get that book or any book you want absolutely free at audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. Download it for free or, or try another one of the one-credit books, audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. If you're already an Audible subscriber, you know, spread the holiday cheer. Give that, give that URL to somebody else so they can try out a free audiobook. And we, we give uh, Audible a huge thanks for their support of Tech News Today. So by all means, if you want to show your support for Audible and Tech News Today, pass that URL around. Let's see what's on the calendar. Well, you know, it's actually a big week for conferences. We've got Ignition, the Future of Digital Conference in New York City tomorrow. New uh, York City. New York City. Uh, tomorrow uh, through Wednesday the 28th. Also tomorrow running through Thursday the 29th is Amazon's Web Services Invent event. That's their first customer partners conference in Las Vegas. I think it's being held at the Venetian. And in San Francisco, the second annual WIMA, W-I-M-A, NFC USA runs tomorrow through Thursday the 29th. It's all about NFC and business applications. What's so funny about that, Tom? Just all, sometimes all of the acronyms. <laughs> it's A-OK. -okay. WIMA. Yeah. It just makes you want to keep going. Yeah, PDQ. NFC conference. That's going to be a big deal. RSVP. Near Field Communications, not National Football Conference. That's correct. Yet. Wouldn't want you to get confused. Go Niners. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. We got a message from David. In episode 633, Tom said that AirPlay worked with everything. Well, do you know? want to know what it doesn't work with? DVDs. You cannot AirPlay a DVD to your Apple TV using Apple's DVD playing software. Really? Works fine with VLC, by the way. Why would they block DVDs from playing over an Apple TV when just about anyone can rip them? I have no idea. And why would they? Why would the DVD player be required to block AirPlay when nothing else on the on OS X is? I mean, I'm sure there's a couple of other exceptions, but I'd never run into this because I use VLC. Uh, and and honestly, I probably haven't run into it because I don't think I've air, tried to airplay a DVD. I don't know when the last time I watched a DVD was. I mean, I'm sure Apple's not really worried about that since they take out all their optical drives out of everything. They're like, yeah, you yeah. don't have a DVD player. Got another email from Kimberly, a.k.a. Texas teacher, in the chat room. She says, I have another very practical reason that kids want eye touches, iPads, and iPad minis. They can take them to school and not get in trouble. Many schools have huh. a bring-your-own-device policy now. There are limits, and teachers need to be familiar with the device as a learning tool. Most schools that use tablets use iPads, so that's what the teachers are familiar with. Hmm. Kids have phones. I work for a low socioeconomic school. Many of our parents have found a family cell phone plan that's cheaper than a landline, especially when they move every couple of months. Two-thirds of my emergency forms this year had none written in the landline area. The parents want their kid to have a phone for when they get home from school before the parents get home. Now some just keep an older phone charged so kids can call 911. Others get hand-me-down phones from friends and relatives when those people upgrade. So yes, I do have second graders with an iPhone 3S in their backpacks, but it isn't as indulgent as you might first think. They got it from their single 19 to 25-year-old cousins, those people who want the iPhone 5. That's, that's well, that, there you go. That, all those people that upgrade every year, that's where their phones go, yeah. second graders. Do, you, do your kids have phones, Lindsay? They don't. Um, I was just, I was funny, I was just thinking about this this morning because the only reason I've kept a landline is basically so that people can call my kids. People, I mean, I never give out anything but my cell phone, but my kids love to answer the phone and call their friends to set up, you know, uh, play dates yeah. or whatever. And it's kind of a weird, I was thinking about this. If I decided to get rid of my landline, how would people reach my children as they start to develop a social life and that's when you start to consider getting them a phone and if they want to ride the bus by themselves then maybe it would be good for them to get in touch with you this is, these are things we're talking about in our family yeah interesting stuff all right that's it uh for this episode of tech news today Lindsay, thank you so much uh for joining us always great to have you on the show uh let folks know again where they can find the cnet holiday gift guide and what, what you guys are up to over there if you just 
type in cnet.com, come to CNET. Um, and it's actually, there's a link in the header. You can click that link. And if you come to CNET today, we have a big promo for our Cyber Monday package. And you can get a rundown on all, every big deal there is today. We're blogging. So that's, that's what we're doing today. Excellent. Yeah, um, I saw Donald visit. Bell's smiling face looking at me. He's looking good. Yep. And we're actually doing a Google chat later in the day, too, if anybody wants to hop in a chat room and talk to us about what there is to buy. Oh, that's great. So yeah, check it out. One o'clock. CNET.com. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching, listening, submitting stories at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, the place to let us know what stories you'd like us uh, to cover each and every day. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is TNT at twit.tv. And you can give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. Tim Stevens from Engadget joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.